Sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, ich freue mich, Sie hier auf diesem Symposium von Nestle NNI zum Thema Update Ernährungstherapie mit der Crohn's Disease Exclusion Guide begrüßen zu dürfen. As our speakers both come from Israel, I'm changing now to the English language. And um, I heartily welcome Ari Levine and Rotem Sigal Bonnet from Tel Aviv in Israel. And I'm very happy uh, that you are here with us and that you will share your experience on the topic of Crohn's disease uh, elimination diet. Both of you have developed together this special type of um, diet and your aim is to ease and to improve the enteral nutritional therapy of children and adolescents and even adults with Crohn's disease. And to make a long story short, I'm very happy for your present, uh, to listen to your presentations now. And Ari is the first one to start. Ari, it's yours. So thank you for inviting me. And I started my talk by saying I miss all my friends whom I cannot meet with. And I hope that we're going to meet again together. And these are my disclosures. And before we start, I'd like to talk about the goals of therapy in Crohn's disease. And the goals of any medical therapy in Crohn's disease would be to induce clinical remission when a patient is active, achieve a decrease in inflammation, and maintain remission in the short term. And in the longer term, we would like to achieve mucosal healing, prevent complications, and reduce surgeries, and importantly, to do no harm. This is the standard of care for any medical therapy. But dietary therapy is now becoming an important uh, therapy, not as an adjunctive therapy, but as a primary therapy in patients with Crohn's disease. And therefore, dietary therapies should meet the same goals as medical therapies if we want to use them in our patients. Now, our first generation dietary therapy is, is exclusive enteral nutrition. And I'm sure you're, the audience is all familiar with this therapy. It's effective for induction of remission. It does decrease inflammation. It does achieve mucosal healing and it does no harm. But there's no maintenance option. It's a short term fix and it can be monotonous and tough and some children require tubes. The Crohn's disease exclusion diet is what I would call a second generation diet. In this case, it's a pathogenesis based diet. It was specifically designed for this disease. It's effective for induction remission. It decreases inflammation. I'm going to show you the data that's effective for maintenance therapy and for mucosal healing, and it uses whole foods, which makes it much more palatable and easy to use over time, in fact, years. But would, our real goal uh, would probably be a third generation diet, which would be a personalized diet that would be individualized based on phen phenotype microbiome, but we're still a ways away from that. We're still dealing with second generation diets. Well, in the last two years, uh, since the Crohn's disease exclusion diet has been published, we've learned quite a bit uh, from a lot of studies. I'm just going to share a few slides. And there, there are a lot of specific researchers who focus on one aspect of diet or one aspect of Crohn's disease. And there's the one food, one disease theory. Is it the fat? Is it the fiber? Is plant-based good? Is Mediterranean diet just as good? And I'm going to share some of these uh, slides with you. The first is uh, I'm going to uh, share with you uh, something that was just presented, hasn't been published yet, but it's the DIME study that was uh, performed in the United States, which randomized patients to specific carbohydrate diet or Mediterranean diet and adult patients, and there were 92 patients. And the outcome of that study that was just presented at the Crohn's colitis meeting in the United States showed that both specific carbohydrate diet and, and, and Mediterranean diet induced clinical remission as far as symptoms in 50% of patients with mild to moderate disease. But uh, Mediterranean diet had no effect whatsoever on inflammation, did not reduce calprotectin, and did not reduce CRP. And the specific carbohydrate diet did not reduce CRP, and less, and less than 25% of patients had a calprotectin response. So it seems that both these diets improve patients' outcomes as far as the patients are concerned, but they do not achieve the goals of a therapeutic diet as they do not reduce inflammation. The Swiss IBD uh, group published this study uh, last year, looking at vegetarians uh, or people on a vegetarian diet who have inflammatory bowel disease. And they demonstrated that uh, patients who were on a vegetarian diet did not really have better outcomes than patients who are on an omnivoric diet. The exception might be with complications in patients with Crohn's disease, shown in this panel right here. But there was no difference in hospitalizations, no difference in surgeries, and overall, a large difference was not detected. So it does not seem that a vegetarian diet is really protective for patients with Crohn's disease. 
But I think one of the most remarkable things that's, some, that's challenged us, and we're very interested in this, and this is going to be an emerging topic that's going to be very big in the next few years, is the changing understanding of fibers. I'm just going to show you one of three studies that have been published over the last two years, all with very similar results looked at a different way. But this was published in gut last year. In this study, you will see in gray cellulose, in blue, inulin, and in rust color pectin. And it turns out that if you provide uh, in animal models uh, inulin, you will get an increase in clostridials and in butyrate production, but you also get an increase in proteobacteria and inflammation. And it, importantly, this uh, providing an inulin based diet or adding inulin into the diet into these models of, uh, of mice with uh, DSS colitis, increased LPS, increased flagellin, increased inflammation, and increased colitis, whereas pectins prevented this, shown in this column over here. So you can see this is an inulin uh, animal model, and this is the pectin animal model, showing that there's no inflammation and no macrophages and no neutrophils providing pectin. This sort of proves that different diets uh, affect inflammation differently and not all fibers are, uh, are important or equal or even beneficial in uh, patients with Crohn's or colitis. Importantly, and this is what is very astonishing about this specific study, is that butyrate is pro-inflammatory under certain circumstances, depending on which bacteria you have and which fiber is being provided. So butyrate can be anti-inflammatory and butyrate can be pro-inflammatory. And this is an emerging topic that needs more study, suggesting that certain fibers should not be possibly provided during inflammation to patients with Crohn's disease. Now, the Crohn's disease exclusion diet, as I said, is a pathogenesis uh, designed diet. It targets the microbiome. It targets the antimicrobial cells and goblet cells, which have a protective effect and bacterial clearance mechanisms. Its major mechanisms are substrate deprivation for the microbiome and re, um, removing dietary components that affect the bacteria, bacterial clearance or barrier. And it's a multi-phase induction and maintenance diet. <clears throat> it targets intestinal permeability, dysbiosis, biofilms, and uh, inability to clear bacteria that have translocated. It's a, a multi-stage diet. It has basically nowadays three stages. The first stage is an induction phase, which is over 12 weeks. The phase one is the first six weeks. The second phase is a step down, but it's still part of the uh, induction phase. And this brings back most of the fruits and vegetables from week 10. And sometimes I see people or hear doctors talking about this very harsh diet, but they haven't actually used it because if they'd used it, they would have realized that this induction phase, phase one is only the first six weeks. And by uh, week seven, there's already bread, fruits, vegetables, and legumes. And you have to look at it as a whole diet. And from week 12, it goes on to a maintenance phase. I'm going to share some of the data with you about maintenance phase, which includes free meals and, uh, uh, and different rest less, less restrictions. And nowadays, we are treating patients who have been in, on the diet for five, six, and I have one patient on 10 years now, in stone remission, by the way. And they're on lifestyle. They're not on a specific diet, but we've adapted their diet uh, appropriately so it can be an easier diet and a personalized diet. We haven't published any data about that yet. So I'm going to move for five minutes to the evidence because that'll be the basis for the whole topic of strategies which will follow. So I'm sure that most of you have read or heard about this study that was in gastroenterology last year. This is the Crohn's disease exclusion uh, diet trial in children. And this is a head-to-head -head trial comparing Crohn's disease exclusion diet to exclusive enteral nutrition diet in patients with mild to moderate uncomplicated luminal disease. And as, in, as you can see, in orange will be the Crohn's disease exclusion diet, and in green, you'll have exclusive enteral nutrition. Over the first six weeks, there was no difference. And in this specific slide, I'm using the most rigorous outcome, which is a PCDAI less than 10. Uh, pharmacological studies, for instance, with biologics use a, a less, more lenient cutoff, but this is a more restrictive cutoff. This difference that you see here between exclusive enteral nutrition and CDD is not real because the difference here is compliance. So if you didn't have the patients that stopped exclusive enteral nutrition were non-compliant, this would not be different. So at six weeks, there's no difference between these two diets for induction remission in the mild to moderate space. But where we see the difference start to appear is from week 12. And in week 12, we reintroduced food from week eight to week 12, gradual reintroduction such that all patients had to be exposed in the exclusive enteral nutrition group to a habitual or free diet by week 12. 
but both groups received the same amount of partial internal nutrition. And this led to a significant drop off as you can see in sustained remission that occurred almost only in the exclusive enteral nutrition group when they moved to partial enteral nutrition with free diet. And this can also be seen in the calprotectin data over here. In the Crohn's disease exclusion diet, by week 12, there was a 76% reduction from baseline in calprotectin. What this shows, at, whereas in the uh, exclusive enteral nutrition arm, once you added food, there was a rebound in calprotectin. And this caused by week 12, the fact that the improvement in calprotectin was uh, less significant than it was for Crohn's disease exclusion diet. And what this tells us is that food is driving inflammation. If the only difference from week six is the use of foods, uh, that means that food is driving inflammation in all these patients. And this is something that we still have to adapt to because this talk about evolving strategies isn't just about Crohn's disease exclusion diet. It's about understanding that the majority of our patients with Crohn's disease have a disease that is being driven by food and we cannot just use a medical strategy and a diet that is being driven almost many of the patients at least by what they eat. Looking at that study again, you can see that the decline in calprotectin was continuous. And in, in, in red here, we have the Crohn's disease exclusion diet. And as I said, there was a 75 or 76% decline uh, by week 12. And there was a similar magnitude of decline for EN. So it's not that EN was uh, not efficient. It's just when you reintroduce food, there's a 50% rebound in calprotectin. In the Crohn's disease exclusion diet, 70% of the patients achieved normal CRP remission by week 12. Looking at the, uh, micro, uh, at the microbiome at a file level analysis, I'm just going to run this very, through this very quickly because it's not the important uh, message that I want to give. But uh, on the top panel, you'll have Crohn's disease exclusion diet. And on the bottom panel, we have exclusive enteral nutrition. Anything in green is something that expands during therapy. And anything in red, that's something that contracts during therapy. And what we can see is that there was a similar response in the microbiome similar decrease in proteobacteria in both groups shown here in red between three o'clock to five o'clock and a similar expansion in uh, firmicutes shown here between six o'clock to 12 o'clock. However, by week 12, there was continued decrease in proteobacteria and further expansion of, of the firmicutes and now bactoids are coming back. Whereas what we see when patients were on the same amount of partial nutrition, partial enteral nutrition, but they started to eat regular food. We lost the effect on proteobacteria completely, and there's no ex continued expansion, even though they're getting more food in this case, suggesting that this we are, uh, patients who have re-exposure to food are regaining dysbiosis, and patients who are on, on the maintenance phase or the second phase of Crohn's disease exclusion diet are continuing to improve, continuing to correct dysbiosis, and we have really good data that we haven't published yet uh, that you want and then again will publish during the coming year. Importantly, we also looked at intestinal permeability at week three. Week three is when there's group two is exclusive enteral nutrition is only on exclusive enteral nutrition. And there was no improvement in patients on exclusive enteral nutrition at week three in intestinal permeability. Whereas 50% of the patients with the Crohn's disease exclusion diet had an improvement in intestinal permeability such they had normal intestinal permeability. This suggests that one of the factors that we're trying to correct with dietary therapy, intestinal permeability is not corrected at all by exclusive enteral nutrition and is corrected by Crohn's disease exclusion diet. And the explanation for that, as far as I'm concerned, is probably fiber, because exclusive enteral nutrition does not contain fiber and are probably not providing the butyrate rate that's needed for tight junction uh, maintenance. Rotem published this study last year looking at the, at the rate of response with both of these diets. And you can see here, <coughs> again, in orange, we have the Crohn's disease exclusion diet. And in green, we have exclusive enteral nutrition. And this is at week three. So you can see there's no difference in rate of response with Crohn's disease exclusive, exclusion diet and partial enteral, enteral nutrition, both of them about 80% response by week three, and both of them about a 60% response by 60% uh, remission by week three. And there's no difference in decline in CRP as well. So these two diets behave very similarly during the induction phase. And this is an important slide, I think, because I'm going to come back to this, showing that this rapid response will allow us to use this as a diagnostic tool and not just as a therapeutic tool. I'm going to show you data that you haven't seen before, and this is from the <coughs> adult trial, which has been concluded and it will be submitted to publication shortly and has also started, has started to be presented in conferences around the world. And this randomized patients to, with mild to moderate uh, disease, primarily at diagnosis, 
uh, to either Crohn's disease exclusion diet with partial enteral nutrition or Crohn's disease exclusion diet without partial enteral nutrition. But we're going to look at the data of the combined cohort because there's not a huge difference between the two. And this is in adults. We can see that the remission rate at week six was 62.5%, which is very nice. So it's a little bit lower than the children, but it's still very high. The sustained remission at week 12 was 55%, still very nice. And there's no drop off through week 24. So sustained remission and intention to treat analysis. So these are all patients who started the diet are in 52% are still in remission, are in remission uh, at week 24, six months into the diet. In this study, patients had colonoscopies uh, before and after. So this was an assessment of mucosal healing. And a third of the patients, or more than a little bit more than a third of the patients, achieved endoscopic remission uh, by week 24 in their follow-up colonoscopy. And if you take the patients that were in remission and continued, it was 50%. So we have good evidence now that this causes uh, sustained remission, can use as a maintenance diet, and 50% of the patients who continued were had uh, endoscopic remission. And all this is with dietary monotherapy and no drugs. It's just an effective diet. Again, suggesting that diet is driving the disease and it can be a very effective tool to treat the disease, especially early in the disease and mild to moderate disease. So if I'm gonna summarize this part of the talk, I would say that Crohn's disease exclusion diet with partial enteral nutrition basically meets all the goals of any medical therapy that we use. It induces clinical remission, it decreases inflammation, it maintains remission, <coughs> achieves mucosal healing, and does no harm, but we don't know yet if it can reduce complications or prevent surgery. Now I'm going to move over to treatment strategies uh, and diet because this is the change the way I practice and I'm hoping it's going to change the way you practice as well. And I think that you're all going to have to change your practice and your assumptions about medical therapy, uh, hopefully by the end of this talk, but not in the coming years when more data emerge. So there are several factors that drive our treatment selection nowadays. These are primarily disease severity at, uh, at presentation. So if a patient's more severe, more likely to get steroids more likely to get a biologic complicated phenotype which case will probably go for more aggressive therapy and the presence of extraintestinal disease but i'm going to suggest to you <clears throat> that there's a fourth factor that should be part of the phenotype that's assessed in driving dietary therapy and that's if the patient has dietary responsive disease and you have to ask yourselves as i think we've asked ourselves is it logical is it rational that if we have a uh, disease that's being driven in 70% of patients, 80% of patients by what they eat, that we just give the medical therapy and have no dietary strategy in place and don't even think about the dietary strategy. We have to have this conversation from the first day we meet a patient. It's just as important as identifying if a patient has a stricture, has a fistula, or has perianal disease. It has ramifications. So this is what we would uh, do in our center right now. So if I had a patient with uncomplicated mild to moderate disease and they're willing to try diet and we have to realize that not all our patients are going to be willing to try diet, we'd start them on the Crohn's disease exclusion diet with partial enteral nutrition and no drugs. And the reason that we're not starting drugs is because we want to find out if they're dietary responsive. And the only way that we'll ever be able to do that is if we use it as a monotherapy in the first six weeks to find out if diet alone is driving remission and improvement in inflammation. And if that is the case, they have a dietary responsive disease, this can lead to three different strategies. The first strategy is CDD monotherapy. And we have many patients nowadays on CDD monotherapy who've never received any drugs. This is not our favored strategy, but this is a strategy that we can offer patients. If they've been, went into remission six weeks and by 12 weeks, they have a really good response in inflammation, their calprotectin is almost normal, their CRP is normal, <clears throat> and they do not want to start drugs, we will allow them to continue with CDD monotherapy as long as we, the patient tells us that they're willing to continue the therapy and be good about it. And as long as they understand that if they do not do well, then we will add medication. This is important because we don't want them to think that they don't have to have medication if, if they're not doing well. So instead of prediction, we're using monitoring. This is a drug-free strategy. And uh, I have patients, as I said, up to 10 years of follow-up now. I'll tell you about one of those patients shortly. The strategy that I favor most is a combination therapy, but it's not two drugs. It's a drug 
with CDD. And we're just gonna launch our first trial uh, in another month with a combination of biologic and diet versus biologic alone. But we don't have data for this at the present time. <clears throat> so if patients responded well, we can add the drug, uh, methotrexate or a biologic. In our case, we don't use, use azithropin that much anymore. And then what we tell the patients is, if at the end of a year of therapy with a medication, you have complete mucosal healing, normal calprotectin, normal MRI, and normal colonoscopy, and you're willing to continue the diet, we're willing to de-escalate the medication and just remain on diet. And we have many patients now that we've de-escalated, uh, many successfully, some unsuccessfully as well. And in this case, this is a reduced drug strategy. This is highly motivating for patients to start dietary therapy because even if they start medical therapy, they know there's an option of reducing medical therapy. And if a patient succeeds to de-escalate and stay on CDD monotherapy down the line, then that's great. And if not, at the worst case scenario, we just go to an, uh, a biologic therapy and continue with that if they relapse. And the third option will be for patients who either refuse dietary therapy because there will be patients say, okay, I did it, but I don't want to continue with it. Or if we think that maybe we want those patients to be on medical therapy for uh, medical reasons. But knowing that they're dietary responsive allows us to use diet as a rescue therapy. And Rotem and Ivi, I published uh, an article in 2017 in 21 patients showing that 60% of our patients who failed biologics went into remission with diet. And we have patients nowadays that never responded to any biologic, but respond only to diet. And every time they stop the diet, they relapse. And every time they go back to diet, they go into remission, even though they're on combination therapy with anti-TNF and methotrexate or Stellar or whatever it is. So there are some patients who will only respond to dietary therapy and others who will benefit from it as a rescue therapy. So let's take the CDD uh, monotherapy. I know this is very controversial for many people, but you're going to get used to it because you're going to have these patients. Who would be the population? There would be un uncomplicated, mild to moderate Crohn's disease with no joint involvement because those patients with arthritis, uh, their arthritis will relapse uh, if you stop the drugs. The advantage is, of course, no drugs. The disadvantage is diet dependency, and this is what we tell our patients. If you're going to do this, you, you can't do this if you're not going to keep the diet. We make this decision at week 6 or 12 in dietary responsive and dietary experienced patients because they've already experienced the diet. Now they can tell us if they're motivated. They can tell us if they're willing to continue the diet. And if a patient goes on to this monotherapy, <clears throat> and that's a relapses after six months or a year, almost all the patients will go back into remission if they go back to the first stage. So once dietary responsive, I won't say always, but almost always dietary responsive. So you can use this tool to reinduce. And the story I'm going to tell you about this is a patient I saw about a month ago who is now 23 years old and who after a year uh, of, of diet decided she wants to travel the world for eight months uh, and when she was 20 or 21. And I said, well, maybe we should give you azathioprine or something as a maintenance therapy because you can't keep the diet. We're going to be traveling all over the world. And she said, I'm not going to take any drugs. Uh, her mother's a physician and wasn't willing to, I, this is, I know this is very frequently that physicians aren't willing to have their children take drugs. And she came back eight months later and she didn't relapse. And the only thing that she had is a calprotectin of 300, which had been normally for. She went six weeks back to the first stage. Calprotectin went back to normal. Her colonoscopy has been no normal, MRE normal, and she's never had drugs. <clears throat> Our favorite strategy, which we try to convince patients, is combination therapy for the first year. The population will be non-severe Crohn's disease using combo therapy addressing both the microbiome and inflammation. We can use this as a de-escalation strategy if this is a patient who does not have arthritis. And the disadvantage, of course, is you're starting a drug. Um, and we will offer de-escalation if the patients have complete mucosal healing and they're willing to perform the maintenance diet and in worst case scenario, if they don't respond or if they relapse and they don't, they're not going to continue the diet, whatever it is, then we can just use an anti-TNF um, at that point. And we can use diet as a rescue therapy. And the population that we use it in are refractory Crohn's disease or loss response before a switch, because we would like to know if this is going to be helpful. It, uh, an advantage, of course, is that combo therapy with diet addresses both the microbiome and inflammation. It can be very effective to treat refractory, uncomplicated disease. <clears throat> it may allow continuation of the medical therapy without switching. And in some patients, as I said, it may be the only therapy that works if diet is driving the disease. And the disadvantage, of course, is that 
it requires patient collaboration. And some of our patients are already kind of dietary exhausted uh, five or six years down the line, and some won't do this and some will do this. And I've had patients refuse to do this as well. So we talked about <clears throat> this in uncomplicated mild to moderate disease. But there's another strategy that we're using right now, excuse me for a second. <clears throat> And that is in complicated mild to moderate disease. So let's say we have a new onset patient who has perianal fistula, or the MRI shows that there's some stricturine or that there's an internal fistula. This is a patient who's gonna go on to a biologic, but we will start, before we start the biologic, and while we're doing all the testing and vaccinations and getting the regulatory approvals, we will start them with CDD plus partial internal nutrition and see if they are dietary responsive. And once we know if they're dietary responsive, then we will offer them one of these two options, either combination therapy or medical therapy. But the difference here is that if the patient's going in any case onto medical therapy and you know you're not going to deescalate because there's perianal disease or because there's a stricture, we can use a different phase of the Crohn's disease exclusion diet to maintain that. And we could use the third phase. So in this case, we could use um, uh, the maintenance phase as a reduction in exposure while they're getting the biologic therapy just to make sure that they're not getting challenged every day, every meal with foods that are harmful. And we're using this now as well. So you don't have to only use the first stage. If you're going to medical therapy, you can also use the third stage as a reduction in exposure strategy. So in conclusion, I think the Crohn's disease exclusion diet is effective for remission in children and adults. It can induce and maintain remission as monotherapy in over 50% of patients in both children and in adults. It's associated with a decline in both calprotectin and CRP, and it's associated with mucosal healing. <clears throat> Importantly, dietary therapy is the best biomarker we have for detection of what I think is the second most important phenotype, that's the dietary responsive disease. And I think we need to know about this about all our patients. And the ideal time to detect this phenotype is at diagnosis before we started medical therapy, because if you start two therapies in conjunction, you won't know which one actually put the patient into remission or which one maintained remission. We can use the CDD phase one for identification of dietary responsive disease and for induction of remission, either at diagnosis or as a rescue therapy. And we can use the CDD phase two or three as a reduction in exposure strategy for patients who are on biologics so that we do have a dietary strategy for all patients if they're dietary responsive. And the flip side is, is that there will be 20 or 30% of patients who are not dietary responsive. And it may be that something genetic is driving their disease. And we know that about 20 to 25% of our Crohn's disease patients have genetic susceptibility. Rotem is actually doing a study right now. Hope in a year we'll have uh, data about uh, the response of uh, patients who have not to. But right now, if a patient is not gonna respond to dietary therapy, why keep them on a diet and why punish them with dietary exposures that aren't helping them? So I think this is, helps all patients if you do this in the first six weeks because you have that piece of information and you can use it wisely. And my time is up and thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, Ari, thank you very much for this uh, great survey and this great presentation concerning CDED. I think um, we can just go through the questions that I've received via the, the app. Uh, they are both concerning the, the function and the effect of modulin. The first question is, why add modulin at all if food is the key, just because of the extra macro and micronutrients, including calories? So it's a great question. And so yeah. the study that I just didn't want to share the whole study before it's published, but you can use Crohn's disease exclusion diet alone without formula. But I think there are advantages, especially in children. And children want to promote growth you have to guarantee a certain amount of protein and calories and vitamins. And we don't want patients to be overly restrictive. And we will have patients who are picky eaters. And if you don't provide a specific diet and specific amount of calories, they might not grow adequately. But it can be effective even without partial internal nutrition. Um, so that is the first answer. Second is that <clears throat> you have very little to lose by offering partial enteral nutrition up front because patients can always refuse to take it or they'll just stop taking it when they don't want to take it. I mean, we can recommend what we like, but patients will do what they like down the line. So if we provide it, and then that's great because we know they're getting the calcium, minerals, vitamins, and protein to drive growth. And if they stop it, it's not the end of the world. It's not like the diet 
won't help at all if you don't take the partial internal nutrition. So I prefer to start in children with it. And in adults, my strategy has a lot to do with their BMI. So in an obese patient, I won't offer partial internal nutrition. And in a malnourished patient, I'll be very aggressive with the partial internal nutrition because that's something that I can guarantee a certain amount of calories and proteins. It's a guarantee. It's nice to know that you can guarantee a certain amount of... Uh, okay, the next question is some... Next question is somehow a variation of this. Is it still necessary to give modulin after 12 weeks? So this is uh, a, a little bit not, of... It's not mm -hmm. necessary. Uh, and in our, even in our diet, we don't require it. Uh, from week 12, there's no uh, mandatory or required partial internal nutrition. We encourage it, uh, but we're, we listen to our patients. Uh, our patients have rights and they tell us what they think. And we say, well, would you be willing to continue this? And if you would, I would like you to continue it. And they say, we're not going to touch this anymore or we can't do this anymore. I said, you don't have to. And then if at some point we have nutritional problems, let's say if we feel that patient's losing weight or is not getting something, then the dietitians will figure out a solution with either regular food or maybe a different formula. But it's not absolutely required. 12 weeks, I like it for the first 12 weeks particularly. I think mm -hmm. it's very important. And also, if a patient's growing well, starts to grow after 12 weeks, then there's no pressure for the biologics or the drugs to introduce them to, to ensure growth. And I know some doctors are very, that say, well, if a patient's not growing well, I'm going to go right to a biologic. Uh, that's their perception because exclusive enteral nutrition has never been shown to improve uh, growth. And we even published uh, data as well as uh, Richard Russell. And so some people will think that, well, that's the reason we have to put a patient on a biology because they, they have growth retardation. But if you provide all the calories and nutrition, you know that your patient again, and they start to grow very nicely, then there's, then we can say there's no, no rush to add medication here. You can continue with monotherapy as long as you're growing well. Okay, but your answers and these two questions, they are the perfect bridge to the next presentation, which will be given by Rotem. And we are very looking forward to your presentation, Rotem, how to optimize CDED. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. And I, I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you very much for the inviter, uh, for inviting me to give this presentation. And during this journey, I would like to show you some uh, data and some uh, uh, um, of our experience. And we will discuss this issue. And if you have further questions, I'll be happy to answer it at a later stage. Those are my disclosures. And as uh, already uh, all of you know, uh, in 2021, exclusive enteral nutrition remains the first line therapy for induction of remission in children with uh, mild to moderate disease. Um, however, um, since we published the study a, a year ago in 2019, the gastroenterology study that was presented by uh, Professor Levine, we know that the, the CDD attracts a lot of interest. And if you can see here in Google, you can see the um, you can see the amount of results and um, you see groups in Facebook and uh, almost everywhere to try to and identify and to understand this diet and uh, a role. And we understand that the patients and also the parents, I really uh, um, prefer solid food diet over exclusive enteral nutrition. And this is a study from the group from Glasgow. And why they, they showed here that uh, they did a survey with the, the patients and parents, and they showed that the, diffi the, the uh, difficulties, and I'm not sure if you see it with the uh, pointer, now you can see it. Okay, so we can see that uh, the, the difficulties with the diet. We can you can see that the, the patients and also parents reported that exclusive enteral nutrition was much difficult um, than uh, a solid food diet. And so I understand that the patients really and the parents want it. And also here you can see the positive and negative um, uh, comments where uh, the exclusive enteral nutrition achieve, uh, achieved. Um, mostly negative comments from both children and parents, and solid food diet achieved um, the most positive uh, comments. So we understand that the patients are really are looking for something else, to understand how much it's difficult to be on uh, this radical uh, treatment, even though it's very, very uh, efficient. 
So when should we consider using the Crohn's disease exclusion diet? We understand that the exclusion of enteral nutrition is the gold standard and it is amazing and very effective uh, treatment. However, and the first, before we are thinking about um, providing the Crohn's disease exclusion diet, we should ask ourselves, first of all, if, the, if we consider exclusive enteral nutrition, if we do consider exclusive enteral nutrition, we should keep in mind the option for CDD. And then there are three questions that I'm asking, asking myself as a physician, not me. Uh, are there any complications? Or if the patient is before surgery, then I will prefer exclusive enteral nutrition. If there are uh, any extra intestinal involvement that um, uh, we are aware of, and if the patient has a severe growth retardation. If all those questions, the answer is no, then you can consider the use of, exclusive, of a Crohn's disease exclusion diet. And there are several additional factors that we need uh, to take into account when we are considering um, to provide patients with the Crohn's disease exclusion diet. And it's, it's about the, the, um, the behavior of each individual patient. So you need to understand it to get to know your patients before you decide it. First of all, patients who are uh, consuming very high uh, amount of uh, processed food, it will be very challenging uh, for them and you need to discuss with them because my, um, I don't want to give them a diet that they will not follow and they will not going to follow to, uh, to do. So the, the idea is that we need to understand and to, to do these negotiations with the parents and uh, the families and the children if they are willing to do this change. So patients that are very selective eater, um, we need to consider it as well. And patients who um, are afraid to try new foods or don't want to try new foods, it will be very challenging as well. And it's something that we should uh, bring up at the, um, at the beginning when uh, we want to start the diet. Also with vegan, it's a bit challenge. Um, and most of the time what we're doing, we're trying to negotiate with them because we need to provide them with sufficient amount of protein and we need to find a way how to do it. And sometimes we negotiate and they give up on something and they're eating an animal protein, even though they're um, for the, at least for the first six weeks. And then we're moving on to um, a different thing. And this is a study that was published a, a year ago and they assessed the time to biologics after exclusive enteral nutrition course. And what they reported, they, they reported clinical remission and also biochemical remission. And after 12 um, months, after one year uh, from completing the course of exclusive enteral nutrition, they reported that 37% of the patients had started a um, um, course of anti-TNF. And every uh, unpublished data from the uh, court, that, uh, from the gastroenterology, um, we have the Israeli court, the part of it is Israel and Canada. So only the Israeli court, they um, continued to sub another sub-study of week 24. And we saw that um, now when I uh, assessed it, that, um, we saw that uh, 14 patients, um, they uh, withdrawal before. But um, from the 49 patients who remained in the, in the sub-study, we found that only seven started uh, anti-TNF, which means that it's not that far from uh, the, uh, the study. It's not that the, those who started the CDD are as a more uh, um, a shorter time to start biologics. So the question that I'm asking myself and you, what are the concerns? Why not to use the Crohn's disease exclusion diet? So I, I found here uh, um, several uh, causes. Is it the efficacy, the weight loss, you're afraid from nutritional deficiencies, or a difficult exclusion diet, or you need more evidence? And I will start from the efficacy, and Professor Levine presented it very nicely um, a few minutes ago when he showed, I will just present here the uh, both randomized controlled trials that um, uh, we had with the diet, and he showed that there was a high efficacy um, in, in terms of response and remission in both groups after six weeks, so we know it works. Um, and also we saw the, uh, the beautiful uh, panel with the calprotectin. We saw that there was a significant reduction in the CDD group and also in the, in the EN group, which uh, came back up. And also the study from the, the adult one that is, uh, is going to be published uh, hopefully soon. And also here you can see a very high remission rate with 62% of the patients who obtained uh, uh, clinical remission. So we have evidence support that it works. What about the weight? 
are we concerned uh, concerned about the weight? So this is this study, this panel here, it's from the adult study, and also here you can see along the twenty uh, fourth uh, weeks, we can see that there was actually increase in um, uh, the weight and not uh, decrease in weight, which is uh, okay for us. And also when I checked uh, with the the start the, the cohort of uh, the the, uh, the gastroenterology cohort, and we assessed there and we saw that also patients over the time they increase their um the weight and there was no we didn't suffer from a weight loss during the period of being on the restricted diet and before moving on i have to say that i think that one of the the, the reasons here is because there is a dedicated dietitian uh, who um, follow the patients and of course this is uh, under the study and the dedicated dietitian really checked um uh, the the weight over time to make sure that they, they, they did not uh, lose weight and so on so this is one of the uh, reason to have the addition as well and um, if the concerns are from nutritional reason you're we're afraid that there will be uh, deficiencies and uh, reduction in macronutrients and so on here i present this is from the adult study and it's only the, um, the the panel from the macronutrients but i will not go through all of it just to show you that uh, in calories, when we're looking on, on the percentage of uh, RDA, um, the recommended daily allowance, and we can see that uh, patients um, achieved in the group who received together with and patients achieved um, more than 100% and uh, above 85% uh, in the other group. And also in terms of protein, we can see that all the patients achieved uh, uh, above, above 100% of their goals for protein and um, in RDA. Is it difficult? Yes, every dietary therapy is difficult, okay? To change something in your life, especially food, which is very important to, to most of us. It's as a cause with the uh, socializing and uh, events and everything, and we really like to eat. Uh, so every diet will be dif uh, difficult. Exclusive anti-nutrition is an example that all of you are familiar with. I'm sure that all of you are familiar with from from uh, the, the patients, how it's difficult for them to perform it. But I think that the way in, to do it is to support the patients. We need to support him from the family, from his friend, and from the healthcare provider. We should support them in, in, any, in any way we can. So how and we help them. So, and we created here a support system that that's supposed to help the patient to follow the diet. They have a, a recipes booklet uh, from the different phases. They have list of specific the dietitian can provide them with list of specific products that with uh, without additives that they are suitable for the CDD at every stage. The, the, the dietitian can provide them with examples of uh, weekly meal, meal plans, shopping list, a meal preparation days advice, and so on. And the idea is um, and that, and that we should remind, remember that not all the patients are the same. There are patients who will need this uh, support and there are patients who will just ask us for um, the uh, list of uh, what to eat and what not to eat, and they want to build the, themselves. And the idea is when you have the, the dietitian to ask the questions up front and to understand what the patients really need for the support, it's very important. And of course, we have the app, um, the mobile app, the Modo Life that I'm sure that all of you are already familiar with, and uh, they have access there to recipes and so on. And it's very uh, helpful uh, tool as well. And I really like this slide because it always makes me very hungry. Uh, but you can see all these foods um, is the CDD friendly foods uh, from the recipes booklet. And it's, it's very nice. You can eat really very, prepare very nice um, dishes from, from, from it. And uh, as you can see here, it's really uh, friendly and, uh, uh, and nice. So we just really encourage patients to go and to try to uh, use um, the recipes. Evidence, of course, I will always say I will always say that we need more evidence for everything. Every new uh, medication, every new I don't know everything. We need more evidence always. Um, but this is the the beginning, and since 2014, when we started to publish the first 
um, uh, case series, um, we saw that we, we could replicate it, and the result with the randomized control trial that Professor Levin presented earlier. And we see that here we just we are building and the, um, um, the, the studies and we are building the evidence. And of course, we need more time and we need um, more evidence to come out in, in order to convince you completely that this diet works. And, and it's totally okay. We just need to keep in mind that um, what we what we already have, and what we already have, we can see that we have a very nice uh, remission rate in all uh, studies among 60 to and, and, and above, which is kind of impressive for a uh, uh, nutritional therapy without uh, medications. So why should we use the chronic disease exclusion diet? And the diet includes all well, food. It's easier to perform and maintain comparing to exclusive nutrition. We showed that it, it was better to, uh, tolerance. It offers uh, eff effective treatment for short and long term uh, for induction or maintenance um, of remission. It includes fiber and the substrate required in order to produce the short chain fatty acids. It's designed to be a nutritional balance and it's allowed part in participation in meal times with the family. It's not uh, that radical, uh, such as the exclusive nutrition, which is still um, the gold standard. It's it's, it's very good uh, and eff effective treatment. So the chronic disease exclusion diet, short is a sustainable diet, multi-seasonal with the pro progressive exposure. There are no regional limitations now when we have the experience with all of the all, all over the world with the uh, app and so on. It's a balance and allowed allows growth uh, and also it's a palatable diet. And the idea is that we, we should really keep it balanced. And the main mechanism of the diet is the reductions of the uh, um, the, the potentially pro-inflammatory um, um, ingredients that we showed in animal uh, models that the Professor Novin I mentioned before, and also we increase exposure to um, other uh, ingredients, which in order to promote some nutritional aspects and for microbial aspect. And as m mentioned before, there are several stages and phases for the CDD. The first phase, which is the most difficult uh, part, is the rest restricted phase, um, with 50% of uh, partial nutrition. Um, phase two, we have reintroduction of more food, and during phase three, the maintenance phase, we'll discuss it uh, in a few minutes. It's gradual exposure to more food, with also 25% um, of the energy requirement for partial nutrition. And I think that one of the mo the questions that I received the most is, is it the mandatory food diet? And the idea is that patients are asking, okay, so sh I don't like banana, what should I do? And here I I'm really approaching you, all the healthcare providers. You need to remember and to understand what is the uh, mechanism of the diet. And the mechanism of the diet, that's why we called it the Crohn's disease exclusion diet. The main mechanism, and the goal here is to exclude the, the, the foods that might cause inflammation. So it's not that if the patients will consume the bananas, uh, apple, uh, or um, uh, or potatoes, it will be better and you will heal. It's not the idea. And um, the idea is that we, we, we uh, develop the diet, which is an exclusion diet. And at later stage, from nutritional reason, we wanted to make sure that the patients, especially children, has a sufficient amount of protein. And as a dietitian, we need to calculate. And if patients is eating a sufficient amount of protein without eating the chicken breast, I'm, I'm totally okay with that, as long as they have the formula or the eggs and so on. So the idea is our uh, our role is uh, our role here is to just make sure that the patient has a sufficient amount of protein. I don't want patients to eat at, at 10 o'clock in the night uh, because the parents are uh, giving them, oh, you didn't eat your eggs today, please eat them and so on. It's not the idea. It, the, the, it's very difficult to exclude all these foods. So the effort that you should put on is the exclusion and not the mandatory food. Um, so I hope I answered these questions. This is the recommend, recommend more recommended food in terms from the microbiome aspect when we wanted to provide more uh, short chain fatty, fatty acids uh, resources and also a uh, uh, protein. But again, it's not the most important part of the diet. So the mandatory foods are mandatory for nutritional reasons, but not mandatory for success with the diet and something that you, we should keep in mind. And so these questions came up just uh, before and uh, Professor Levin answered it um, 
Uh, so we just make a uh, very short. Yes, in the in the new study with the adults, we assess the role of partial nutrition. We need to remember, first of all, this is a pilot study with only 40 uh, patients, so it's not powered to answer this question. And the main uh, idea of this diet of this study was to assess the role of uh, the chronic disease exclusion diet in an adult. But we saw that there was no significant difference in uh, in remission uh, along the way. Uh, so it, it's possible, but again, we do recommend the use of partial enteral nutrition. And I have to say that I sleep more well when I know that the patient has all the macronutrients he needs and everything um, macro and micronutrients he needs. And I think that's part of healing. We need to heal the same, um, as well the, the nutritional um, uh, intake. So I will be, I will offer it, uh, and I will be more aggressive in patients who are. Uh, um, they were the mal, uh, malnourished, but in patients who are overweight, I will not say, uh, I will maybe ask them, not always, I will suggest it even, but if the patients are using the uh, the diet without partial nutrition, in the adult study, we always supplemented them with them with calcium because this is the only um, macronutrients that uh, it, uh, it is not nothing in the diet. But I have to say that in practice, usually I also recommend multivitamin. And sometimes it will be every day or every other day. It depends on the nutrition and analysis that I will ask the patients. And uh, if the patient is using without it, I will uh, recommend them to do it. What about the fruit and vegetables? This is an additional question that I receive a lot. Um, why we selected only specific uh, nutrition uh, um, uh, fruit and vegetables so first of all historically we recommended all patients to avoid fruit and vegetables but to, nowadays we understand that this is important to improve the microbiome so we want to encourage patients to consume it but to be very um uh, we're very cautious we really want to make sure that we don't do harm and we don't cause any um obstruction or if the patient has strict cure is not always we will be aware of it when they start in the diet, sometimes the MRE will come after. And so we really try to do it um, very um, gradually and we are um, we are doing it slowly. So we limited the, 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 the amount of fruit and vegetables because of the inflammation. We are afraid from stricture. And we uh, recommend patients to gradually introduce over time. And we recommend not to consume all at once, to do it uh, just to spread it along the, along the day and for week 10 almost all fruit and vegetables are allowed and um, again the sele we selected the fruit and vegetables because of the resistant starch and pectin sources but again it's not uh, the mandatory part and of course we should be very cautious by saying that um, for instance if patient doesn't like one of the fruit and vegetables, you can convert him, but just to make sure that it, uh, with fruit and vegetables, it does not have a uh, um, high amount of fiber. And th this is one of the, our role as well. Um, another question that came up, and this is a, a, an example from Spain. This is a study that was published from uh, our colleagues in, uh, in Malaga. And they wanted to, to see if um, what are the expenditure. If um, we're always afraid that healthier food is uh, is more expensive uh, than um, not uh, than processed food, which is true. But I don't know if this is the same price for every country. But it, it, this is an example. What they did here, the summer, the summarized. Um, uh, menu for each of the stages and it showed the price that they achieved for each uh, of the stages and where they compared it for modern but again it's not the same in each country and every country with their own insurance um, but they showed that it will be it, it was also a, a cheaper approach so if it's something that is coming up with the patients if uh, you should uh, you can always uh, check it with the patients as well the maintenance phase, a lot of questions that we receive about this uh, part as well. And I have to say, the first two uh, phases are, uh, we have a strict protocol that we know what to do, what not to do. The maintenance phase is more as its own challenges. Because first of all, um, we, we have the free meals. And during free meals, every patient do whatever he wants to do. We showed that in the main, in, in the adult study, it worked well, and patients were exposed to free meals. And now we are investigating uh, which free meals and so on. But patients who were exposed to free meals were able to still maintain the diet. So it's a gradual introduction of food. There are free meals over the weekend. 
We are encourage patients to maintain the, the CDD principles over the, week, the weekdays. Um, and the first question that I would ask patients is what do they miss the most? And I think that here we need to listen to the patients. And sometimes we will need to negotiate with them because we need to understand that our goal is to help them uh, to do the diet. And um, we, we need to find a way that both of us will agree on. What about compliance? I have to say that this is a very challenge, uh, very challenge, challenging part because to assess compliance, uh, it's not always we have an uh, objectives and uh, measures, so it, it's kind of uh, challenging. But you can see that we we, we were able to have um, a high compliance rate in, in, after six weeks, twelve weeks, and also um, twenty four weeks with almost. 50% uh, of patients who um, maintain the diet in a group one, in group two, and in total cohort. So we can see that there was a high compliance rate, which is in very important uh, as well. As Ari mentioned before, um, the additional uh, advantage of using dietary treatment is the rapid response. And we found that there was a rapid response that 83% of patients responded after um, and the response after uh, three weeks, um, which is kind of amazing because we just need to start the, the, the treatment even before the medical, um, the, the, med the medications uh, as mentioned before, and we will know if the, the, uh, it works for the patients or not. As, as it was demonstrated earlier, it, there was no significant difference between the CDD and um, exclusive enteral nutrition, so I'll not go through it again. But if I did not convince you uh, yet, and it's totally okay, um, maybe we should consider a short course of exclusive mental nutrition for two weeks. And what are the cases that we will provide or ask patients uh, to do to start with exclusive mental nutrition? First of all, in more severe cases, we will ask patients to do it. In patients who are hospitalized and in, in patients, uh, um, we will offer them to start with exclusive mental nutrition. And then when we are going back, um, we will gradually expose them to CDD uh, uh, friendly food and also patients who need more time and education in order to prepare the, the kitchen and to prepare all the grocery shops and everything. We will start with them with the uh, disease exclusion and we will start with them exclusive mental nutrition and then we will follow to uh, the chronic disease exclusion diet. And uh, the, the study that we published with patients who lost response to uh, biologics and um, five patients did two weeks course when they were hospitalized and they did two weeks of EEN and then they moved to the CDD and three of them achieved remission after six weeks. And uh, coming soon, um, of course, we need to uh, study it in uh, a randomized control trial. We have the diatomics uh, quant disease trial, which What's is a prospective. Yes? May I ask you to prepare for landing because there are open questions and so we can, let you please. I'm almost, I'm almost finished. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, so we have the diatomics trial, which is a prospective trial, uh, all, uh, already 50, uh, 50 patients enrolled, and it's from uh, a multinational, uh, and we, will, we are waiting for the result. And this is the, uh, the study, which will, um, we will assess two weeks of exclusive enteral nutrition, which will follow with the CDD or a, a complete eight weeks of, of the EN. And one of the, the main uh, thing is the uh, nutritional, the role of the dietitian, the multidisciplinary uh, team. The dietitians need to be there for the patients uh, in order to uh, educate him, to explain him, and uh, to encourage and motivate him along the way to answer his questions, and also to understand if the patient is a good candidate for this treatment or not. So to conclude, uh, as uh, the group from Malaga um, uh, wrote, the quantity exclusion diet provides a scientific, uh, constructed, and argued value of dietary restriction in these patients together with professional dietary support. And I found uh, this, uh, I don't understand anything from your uh, um, your position paper, but this is a position paper of your group. Um, and the conclusion here um, was that it, it might be a, a good treatment for several, several of the patients. And you do believe that in the future it will be a, a good uh, a tool for the patients. And I will end with this, with this hope. And I hopefully will help all the patients that we are able to uh, help them. And with that, I would like to thank you all for listening and for being here. And you are welcome to visit 
the model life expert to that. Rosalind, thank you very, thank you very much for your presentation. Very practical, and um, there are several questions that uh, dropped in, and. Um, I want to start with the first one. Are there any patients that you exclude intentionally from CDED because of their social, cultural or family situation at the very beginning of the induction phase? Um, not, no. Of course, it's, it's a negotiation with, with, the, with the patients. And if the parents and everyone are willing to help and there is someone to help um, the patients, we will do an and help him. But if the family said that they don't have someone to do it or they don't have someone to take care of the, the, the children, so yes, of course, we will not give him something that he cannot do. And sometimes there are, pati there are patients who that excuse their nutrition will be easier for them to, to perform it too because they don't have someone to take care of them. Okay. Here's a critical question. What can be the reason if the experiences from other countries do not show these good results as with you. Are we setting the diet wrong? What are our faults? First of all, I would like to, uh, to hear from you. If you, have, uh, you don't have a good experience, just contact me. I have, the email is all over and you can contact me and we can uh, discuss and uh, uh, see if something that we can help. I'm not aware of it. I'm aware from, I, I, received, I received the good vibe. Um, so I'm not aware of the negative, but if you have negative, we can find and try to see if there is something that you are doing wrong or something in, in, that we can help. Uh, so feel free to contact me. Thank you. That's a great offer. And the one who has uh, asked this question uh, will find your email, I'm sure. Uh, another one uh, is, do I understand it correctly that if the amount of mandatory food is not consumed, consumed are you not instructing the patient strictly to actually consume it? Yes, I do not. I, I will not. If the patient doesn't like any of the mandatory food, it, it, it is totally okay if you will not consume it. Again, the idea is that we I don't want to, um, uh, to force patients to eat something that they don't like to eat. I don't think that it, it is mandatory for success of the diet. And from the first cohort that we, uh, we, we did the, the study, it's without the mandatory food. So I think that the added value of the mandatory is just a nutritional and microbial aspects. So mm -hmm. I will not force him. My goal is to educate him to exclude the, the things that are very, very difficult for them. So if they don't eat a sufficient, they don't eat the, the, the eggs, but they do eat a sufficient amount from protein from other source, from the formula, or from the chicken breast, so I'm, I'm, I'm okay, I'm relaxed. But if they don't eat it, so I will just make sure that they have the, the, the amount of protein. Okay. Then there is a, a point, I think, uh, there's a question, I think you already have given the answer. What, to, uh, what about starting with EET and if bad compliance lead to stop, uh, then to transform it to CDED? I think that's what you have yeah. just that, shown us. The, Do the model, this is the, the atomic study. And I just I have to say that the advantage here is that the patients, when you are giving them food after EEN, it doesn't matter which food is it, they are so happy and they are willing to accept anything. So the, the CDED is very welcome with patients after EEN. <laughs> There's one question obviously uh, done by a nutritionist. Model life is great. Is there any way to specially train nutritionists? And yes, there are training options and possibilities, and I'm quite sure that there, there will be a link uh, to yes, these. Yes, there is uh, a link in my presentation. You can visit here, the Model Life Expert, and then mm -hmm. you have an online training with everything that we know. We put there, and it's for you. Use it. You just need to, to do the models there, and you have all the information you need about the diet. Okay. Thank you very, very much to both of you again. And I think this was a very uh, vivid and interesting and very up-to-date session. And it has been very great that uh, we have had the opportunity to meet you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very, Thank you much. very much for inviting us. Thank you very much to the audience and for their interesting questions. This gives me and uh, gives me the impression that you have met the interests of the audience too. and. I think the message has really reached the listeners. Okay, see you Thank hopefully you. soon. Bye. 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 Bye.